Welcome to Redeeming Grace Fellowship. It's good to see you guys this morning. If you have a Bible, open it up to John 8. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 47. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 47 will be up on the screen if you don't have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible at all, if you don't own a Bible and you want one, take the one that you have in your hand that you grab from the chair in front of you. There are some gift Bibles out there on that table. Please take a Bible if you don't own one. We want you to read God's Word. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 47. This is the Word of God according to the Apostle John. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you'd be doing the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but He sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, and I pray that you would bless this time together in your word. Lord, we are utterly dependent upon you and your grace to move in our hearts, and I ask that you would do that. I pray for those here, if there are any that do not know you through faith in Jesus, that you would take the words of Christ in this passage and penetrate the unbelief in their hearts that they might believe, that they might see Jesus Christ for who he really is. And for those of us who know you, who've come to be strengthened by the word and encouraged by the fellowship, Lord, ultimately, to be together as your people, to worship you. We pray that you would work in our hearts as well, that you would help us to grow in Christ-likeness as we follow after him and live in the freedom he provides. So we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week we looked at John chapter 8, 
verses 12 through 30, and we saw what it meant for Jesus to be the light of the world. Jesus has come into the darkness of the world as the true light, John chapter 1 tells us. And that true light reveals the path to God. The light of Jesus exposes us for who we are and reveals our greatest need, namely forgiveness of sin. The light of Jesus illuminates our path and leads us to the foot of the cross <clears throat> to see the saving work that he accomplished there. Jesus is the light of the world. We also saw a real life illustration of what it looks like for the life of the world to be met by unbelieving, impenitent hearts. In John chapter 8, verses 13 through 30, the Pharisees and Jesus engaged in yet another controversial showdown in which Jesus elaborated on his relationship to his Father. He demonstrated how that relationship that he has with his Father proves that he is the light of the world and how unbelievers in darkness like the Pharisees will remain there apart from repentance and faith in him. But when the encounter between Jesus and the Pharisees came to a conclusion, it appeared that the passage ended on an uplifting note. John 8.30, as Jesus was saying these things, many believed in him. And that's when we come to verse 31, where the apostle John begins, so, or therefore, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. It's our link back to last week's passage. Jesus is now turning from conversation with the Pharisees to address those who appear to believe in him in verse 30. And we should ask ourselves, was it true saving faith or was it dead spurious faith? We've seen both in this gospel several times. In John 2, those who believed on Jesus on account of the signs, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in all people. We saw that. John 6, we saw thousands professing faith in Jesus go on to abandon him. No longer walk with him, the text says. The rest of this morning's passage will reveal what kind of faith we're dealing with here in verses 30 through 47. Jesus begins his discourse to the Jews who had believed in him with a conditional clause. Look at the beginning of verse 31. If you abide in my word. If you abide in my word. And then he gives the three results that occur if that condition is met. First, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. These Jews in verse 30 profess to believe in Jesus, and then he hits them with what proves their faith to be genuine, namely perseverance. Perseverance in the faith. To abide in the word or teaching of Jesus Christ is to remain in the word or teaching of Jesus. Those who persevere or abide or remain in his word are the ones labeled by Jesus as being true disciples, or true believers. When you see disciples, just don't take disciples as really strong, good Christians, and then there's believers. The New Testament, are, they're treating those as the same. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a believer, you're a disciple. And if you make it halfway and you bail out like the people in John 6, those who were following him and then no longer walked with him, you're not abiding in his word. Therefore, you're not a disciple. Therefore, you're not a believer. Second, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth. If you abide in the word or teaching of Jesus Christ, you will know the truth about reality. You will be able to discern between what is true and what is false. You will know the ultimate embodiment of truth, Jesus Christ himself. You will know the truth about who God is and who you are. This is an important issue in the light of the rest of the passage. 
We need to know the truth about who God is and who we are. These two things are some of the most important foundational truths if we're going to understand ourselves and the world around us. John Calvin, a French theologian from a long time ago, 16th century, he said it this way, Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely in two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. We need to know who we are and who God is if we're going to have any sort of true wisdom whatsoever. Third result that occurs if we abide in Christ's word. It's intimately tied to the second. If you abide in my word, second one, you will know the truth. Third one, the truth will set you free. If you abide in the word of Christ, the truth will set you free. When we know the truth about who we are and who God is, we experience real freedom for the first time ever. After stating that true wisdom consists of right knowledge about God and ourselves, Calvin goes on to write this. Every person, therefore, on coming to the knowledge of himself, is not only urged by God to seek God, but is also led as by the hand to find him. When the word of Christ exposes us, a true knowledge of ourselves, when we see who we really are by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, we turn to see God. Because when we understand who we are, when God reveals that to us, we understand our desperate need for God. So it's as if God is leading us by the hand. When the word of Christ exposes us to a true knowledge of ourselves and leads us to embrace the reality that actually is and not the one that we're making up in our heads. We are then exposed to the true knowledge of God which leads to real, genuine freedom. When we abide or remain in the word of Christ, we will know the truth and that truth will set us free. Now, Jesus' teaching about the results of abiding in his word leads to an implication Jesus says that when we know the truth, it will set us free, which implies we're not free. And in our passage this morning, the Jews who are being addressed by Jesus realized that's the implication of his teaching. Verse 33, we read their response. We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? The Jews realized that Jesus was saying they were slaves who needed to be set free through the knowledge of the truth. Their response clearly demonstrated they understood what he was saying, that they were slaves. They respond, we're the seed of Abraham. We are God's chosen people. We're not slaves to anybody. That response seems a little strange if you have any familiarity with the Bible or biblical history because they were slaves several times. 400 years in Egypt under Pharaoh until Moses led them out in the Exodus. Southern kingdom of Judah taken into captivity in Babylon 70 years. How many of you have heard about Daniel and the lion's den before? Don't be shy. Most of you. That happened in Babylon during captivity. The northern kingdom of Israel, 10 tribes of Israel. So there's Judah and another little tribe, and then 10 other tribes divided. That tribe taken to Assyria, captive. There were several cycles in the period of the judges. Anyone ever hear of the Old Testament book, Judges? Yes, people. Read that book. You'll see cycle after cycle of Israel falling into sin and being taken into judgment, God giving them over to be ruled, so to speak, by these unbelieving leaders and then raising up a judge to deliver them. So with that being the case, what are they saying by saying, we've never been enslaved to anyone? Because they have. 
I don't know what they're saying. Are they simply just lying about their own history? Are they referring to some kind of inward spiritual bondage, which may be the case? Because that's where Jesus is going. One thing's clear, regardless of what they're trying to say. Their default reaction to Jesus calling them slaves who needed to be set free by the knowledge of the truth is to rest and rely on the fact that they were born into the old covenant people of God. In other words, they see the fact that they physically descended from Abraham, the patriarch of Israel, as defining everything about them. They see themselves as truly belong to the people of, the God, people of God and therefore free simply because they are part of the nation of Israel. They think they were born God's children because they were born Jewish. Throughout the rest of the passage, Jesus is going to slowly deconstruct their misguided thinking. The first way that he does that is by teaching them who their slave master actually is. Jesus revealed the Jews' enslavement to sin. Look at verses 34 through 36 again. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus' initial response to the Jews claim to have never been slaves to anyone is to say, truly, truly, amen, amen. We've talked about that. He uses that all the time. Listen, I'm about to say something very important. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And the implication is that the Jews he's addressing are those slaves. They are slaves to to sin. Just because they are descendants of Abraham does not mean they are born free. Being born into the old covenant people of God, Israel, does not leave you untouched by the infection of sin. And even though Jesus is specifically addressing these Jews who claim to have believed in him, who say we've never been enslaved by anyone, he's going further than just saying, you're slaves of sin, Jews. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, Jesus says. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, Gentile just anyone other than a Jewish person, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you practice sin, you're enslaved by it. You're a slave. I'm a slave. And do you know how many people on the planet practice sin? Sin, meaning it's their lifestyle, it's what defines them. How many people on the planet practice sin before knowing the truth of Christ's word and being set free? How many? Everyone. Everybody. To say that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, it's just another way of saying everyone who is born is a slave to sin. Because every person who has ever been born other than the Lord Jesus Christ is sinful and corrupted. That's not just the testimony of John 8.34. That's the testimony of all of Scripture. Psalm 51.5, we were brought forth in iniquity and conceived in sin. Psalm 58.3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. Ephesians 2.3, which we'll look at again in a minute, says that we're by nature children of wrath, having been born dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, we are all born as slaves to sin, and what we desperately need is to be emancipated from this slave master, or we will perish. And it's on the heels of this devastating revelation regarding our enslavement to sin that we see exactly how this emancipation from slavery's bondage occurs. Verses 35 and 36. Again, Jesus says, The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, to fully understand Jesus' teaching here, you've got to understand just a little bit about first century slavery. Not a lot, just a little. 
and it's kind of intuitive. When Jesus says that the slave does not remain in the house forever, he's saying the slave is not a perpetual part of the family. He's not a permanent part of the family. He's a slave. He can be sold. He can be traded. He can redeem himself by his own freedom. He can be let go by the family. A slave does not have the same familial status as a son or a daughter. However, the son remains forever. Sons and daughters aren't sold. They're not traded. They're not removed from the family. You're a part of your family. You know, they say, what's that phrase? You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family or whatever. I don't know. There might be something about picking your nose in there. I don't know. It's like from when you're a little kid. I don't know. But it's true. You don't pick your family. You're born into it. And once you're in, you're in. You're part of the family. You remain a part of the family. Jesus is making the ultimate contrast here between the Jews who claim to be children of Abraham and therefore children of God and himself as the only begotten Son of God. They think they are offspring of Abraham, children of Abraham, patriarch of Israel. Jesus says, you're not children, you're slaves to sin. Which means they don't have a perpetual place in the house or in the family. However, Jesus Christ, the Son of will remain in the house of his father forever. And in light of being the son of God, he is the only one able to set slaves free and not only set them free from slavery, but to make them a son too. To make them a daughter too. Permanent members of the household, of the family. If the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If Jesus sets you free, you're no longer a slave to sin, but rather a son or a daughter of God. So the first way that Jesus deconstructed the Jews' appeal to being offspring of Abraham as evidence of their freedom is by revealing, no, you're slaves. You are enslaved to sin and you need to be set free by me, the son. That's the first thing he does. Now he's going to further deconstruct their misguided thinking by revealing the fact that there are two spiritual families that exist in this world. Verse 37, Jesus says, I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. In other words, Jesus knows they're physical descendants of Abraham, but again, it doesn't mean they're free from sin. In fact, they're demonstrating throughout this gospel that they are slaves to sin because they want to murder the Son of God. And the reason they want to murder him, according to Jesus, is because his word finds no place in him. It's taken us back to the beginning. They don't abide in his word. They don't remain in his word. It has no place in them. The word that one must abide in to prove that they are truly his disciples finds no place in these so-called believers. Verse 38, Jesus goes further than giving evidence to demonstrate their enslavement to sin once more. He reveals that something even more foundational to their relationship to sin and hatred is here. Something deeper begins unpacking these two spiritual families slowly throughout the passage. In verse 38, Jesus says, I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. We know who Jesus' father is. Jesus' father is God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. His father is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who's the Jew's father? He doesn't tell us yet. Keep going. They once again then claim Abraham as their father, beginning in verse 39. But then, verses 39 through 41, Jesus reveals that their unrepentant, unbelieving hearts, which are filled with hatred for him as the Son of God, that betrays their claim to be children of Abraham. Jesus once again says, you're not doing the works of Abraham by seeking to despise me and kill me. You're doing the works of your father. 
So there it is again. He's kind of leading up to it. You're doing the works of your father. That's when the Jews get really offended, really irritated, and resort to calling Jesus a bastard. That's what I think is happening in verse 41. Jesus told the Jews, you're doing the works your father did. And they respond by saying, we were not born of sexual immorality. It's like, what are you talking about? Where did that even come from? How is this related to anything going on in the conversation? We were not born of sexual immorality. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. We're familiar with the Christmas story. His mother, Mary, came to be with child by the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Before her and Joseph were married. So the obvious thinking of anyone that knew anything about the circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus was that he was an illegitimate son. The Jews of Jesus' day, several of them, and apparently these ones in verse 41, think that Jesus was born outside of the covenant of marriage and therefore born in sexual immorality. But not the Jews, not the children of Abraham. They say in verse 41, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one Father, even God. You'll see this irony all over the Gospel of John. The audience says one thing about Jesus, but they don't know anything about Jesus. Now they've done it. They've gone from saying, we're the children of Abraham. Abraham is our father. Now they are saying, God is our father. And that's when Jesus goes into even more detail, unpacking the two spiritual families that exist. He does it first negatively by excluding the possibility that God is their father. If God was truly their father, they would love Jesus. Why? Because Jesus came from God the Father and speaks the very words of God the Father. Their disdain for Jesus and rejection of him proves without a shadow of a doubt they're not of God. God is not their father. That was true of the Jews in Jesus' day and it's true of anyone in our day who claims to know God and have God as their father. If you do not love Jesus... No matter what you say, no matter what you do, you don't love God. The love of God is not in you. If you do not love Jesus as the Son of God, you do not have God as your Father. No matter how religious you are. Or no matter how many times you go to church or a mosque or a synagogue or wherever you go. If you reject Jesus, as the Son of God, you do not have God as your Father. You cannot be a child of God while rejecting Jesus as the Son of God. And once again, Jesus reveals that the reason the Jews don't understand his teaching is because they cannot bear to hear his word. They will not abide in his word. And they cannot abide in the word of Christ because they only do and say what they have learned and seen from their father. So the obvious question is, who's their father? Who is the father of these unbelieving Jews if God is not their father? Jesus unveils the fact that within the two spiritual families that exist, we find two spiritual fathers. Namely, God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Satan the devil. Jesus talks about Satan as their father in verses 44 through 45. Look at it again with me. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. The Jews have a spiritual father, but it isn't Abraham, and it certainly isn't God. It's Satan. 
Their spiritual father is the devil himself. Jesus said at the beginning of verse 44 that they are of their father, the devil. They are of him, which means they are of his nature. Their will is to do their father's desires. And Jesus lays out the father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He wants to kill. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. He's the father of lies. He's the ultimate liar. The desires of the unbelieving Jew's father, Satan, is to murder, reject and distort the truth, and lie. And because they are of the devil and will to do his desires, when they hear the truth that Jesus speaks, they don't believe him. This theme of two spiritual families, family of God and the family of the evil one, just like what we saw earlier, it's not just something true of John 8. This is a theme that runs through the entire Bible from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of Revelation. After mankind fell in the Garden of Eden through Adam, our first father's sin, which brought judgment upon the entire created order. God promised Adam and Eve the hope of salvation. In Genesis 3.15, God looked upon the ser- Satan, who was in the form of a serpent in the garden, and said to him, I will put enmity or hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's ultimately, that's the first promise of the gospel. Bible scholars call that. It's ultimately a promise regarding the fact that a savior, Jesus Christ, would be born of the seed of the woman and that he would crush Satan's head at the cross through his death and subsequent resurrection. But in that verse, we also read that there will be enmity or hostility between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. In other words, throughout human history, even to this day, there exists hostility between the seed of the serpent and the seed of God. That's why we shouldn't be surprised when we read or hear or see about the horrific atrocity of 21 Coptic Christians being beheaded by a religious organization. Should we weep and pray? Yes. Absolutely. Should we be surprised? Not at all. Not at all. The offspring of the serpent are hostile to the offspring of God. It's also why we aren't surprised when we see the seed of the serpent in John 8, unbelieving Jews who want to do their father's desires, acting out in hostility against the ultimate seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, going as far as seeking his death. And, just as slavery to sin is not exclusive to the Jews in John 8, neither is being children of the devil. Being born as a descendant of Abraham, or... Being born into a moralistic, American-loving, church-going family, neither one of those mean you belong to the family of God. In fact, we are all born as slaves to sin, as we saw, and we're all born as children of this devil. Moreover, there is an intimate relationship to us being born as children of the devil and our enslavement to sin. Listen to the way the Apostle Paul describes this reality in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Before we are set free 
by Jesus Christ from the slavery to sin and adopted as sons and daughters of God, the Apostle Paul describes us as being dead in the sins in which we once walked. Before knowing Jesus, he says that we were following the prince of the power of the air. That's just a reference to Satan. And that Satan, the prince of the power of the air, he's the spirit at now work in the sons of disobedience. You hear that familial language, sons? They're sons of disobedience. Before knowing God through faith in Jesus, we were sons of disobedience who followed the course of this world. We were slaves to sin and sons and daughters of Satan, just like the Jews in John 8. That means that if you are here this morning and you have not repented of sin, turned from sin, fleed from sin, and run to the cross of Jesus Christ, if you have not done that, trusting in Christ to save you from this slavery to sin, you do not have God as your Father Apart from being born again by the Spirit of God, placing your faith in Jesus Christ, surrendering Him to Him as Lord and King, and being adopted as a child, you will remain a son of disobedience, a child of wrath, a slave to sin. Jesus closes this section of Scripture like this in verses 46 through 47. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. How do you know that you've been set free from the slavery of sin and made a son or daughter of God? How do you know it's real? Jesus answers in verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. A heart that is not submissive to the words of Jesus and rebels against his authority with everything they have is evidence that you're not of God. Just as despising Jesus, seeking to kill him, and not being able to hear and obey his word demonstrated that the Jews of his day were of their father the devil and not of God, dismissing the words of Jesus, hardening your heart against him, and remaining in unbelief today demonstrates you're not of God. Therefore, if that's you, not of God, You need God to do something radical in your heart today. You need to be made alive in Christ, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 2, 4. You need the Son to set you free. We don't set ourselves free from slavery. We need to be set free. We don't make ourselves alive. God makes us alive. And the instrument that he uses to do that is the gospel. The good news of what Jesus Christ has done to save slaves to sin. To save people like the ones in John 8. To save people like us who were born into sin. He has done something glorious to save us. To rescue us. Jesus lived the sinless life that we cannot live because of our enslavement to sin. He did it. He lived a perfect life of obedience to the law of God. He went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He bore on the cross what we deserve to bear in our own bodies. You remember we read Ephesians 2.3. It says that we were by nature children of wrath That Hebrew phrase means deserving of wrath. That's what it means to be a child of wrath. It means everything in you, apart from God, deserves his judgment and wrath. Jesus went to the cross and bore that. 
Jesus went to the cross so that you would no longer have to be a child of wrath. He bore the wrath for us in our place. And he was buried. And three days later, he was raised from the dead by the power of God. And the word tells us that he ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he rules and reigns over all things, having been given all authority in heaven and on earth, even the authority to forgive sinners like us and to make us children of the one true and living God. And as he reigns at the right hand of the Father, Paul, the apostle in Acts 17, says that he calls all men and women everywhere to repent because one day he will return for his own. For those of us who have been set free by the Son, for those of us who have experienced adoption as sons and daughters through faith in Christ, I just want to ask, are we living in the freedom, grace, and power that we've been given. You've been set free from the slavery of sin and adopted as a child of God if you know God through faith in Jesus Christ. I just want to close with the words of the Apostle Paul, Romans 6, 16 through 18. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Key, key phrase. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. If you know Christ, you have been set free. You have been made a daughter, a son. Therefore, let us not fall back into the slavery of sin. Let us fight our sin and our unbelief with the power of the promises of God, knowing, resting, and trusting in all that Jesus Christ has done for us. Praise God for the work of his son, which leads not only to freedom from sin, but to adoption, to a new father, Heavenly Father.